uh, Leo is going to talk to us about a scheduling target of opportunity observations in um, multi-messenger astrophysics. And uh, without any further ado, just um, take it away, Leo. Thank you very much. And thanks for um, giving me some time to speak today. So um, uh, this is going to focus on a topic called integer linear programming, which I think is well known to um, many of the people on this call for planning observations of not only gravitational wave sources, but as scheduling astronomical observations more generally. Um, so as we know, we have a good problem that we have this worldwide network of gravitational wave detectors. And uh, we are now in this era of multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, the problem is that gravitational wave localizations are extremely coarse. Um, the one instance where we have detected a unambiguous counterpart uh, in electromagnetic radiation of a gravitational wave signal was GW170817. And this, is, this was the best case of a localization that was only about 30 square degrees. Typically, we're dealing with localizations that are hundreds or thousands of square degrees. Um, so, as we all know, multi-messenger astronomy is extremely important. It's responsible for the biggest breakthroughs in astrophysics of my lifetime, uh, starting in 1987 with, you know, the year I was born with Supernova 1987A, 1987A um, with low energy neutrinos. Of course, GW170817 with EM emission across the entire spectrum and ice cube 170922A um, with um, high energy neutrinos in coincidence with a gamma ray flare from an active galaxy. And of course, we all know that uh, multi-messenger astronomy will be important for many years to come. And it, it's almost certain to emerge as one of the main themes of the 2020 decadal survey. Um, and NASA is interested because NASA missions turn out to be key for all of these science targets, particularly Hubble, Fermi, Swift, Chandra, New Star, and many other missions that are in the works, including one that I'm supporting called Dorado, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later here. Um, but then there are also some common challenges across all multi-messenger uh, transients. Um, we have these large irregular regions of interest. Uh, they're unpredictable because our gravitational wave or neutrino detectors see most of the sky. So these events occur at any time in any place. Uh, the time scales are typically very rapid, so we need very prompt follow-up. These phenomena are typically multi-wavelength, so we need panchromatic follow-up. And to get the data that we need, uh, we need to coordinate multiple missions, multiple facilities on the ground and in space. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I think a slide got skipped. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, so, uh, so, so let's talk about how we plan those observations. Um, so I'm gonna use as, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Zwicky Transient Facility because this is a facility that I work with um, and that I know very well. Um, so uh, I think everyone's familiar with ZTF. Um, it has a, almost a 50 square degree camera. Um, and uh, so the objective is to maximize the probability of detecting the counterpart of the gravitational wave source um, by tiling the error region. Um, and uh, you know we got us, and so we start with trying to maximize the probability that's contained within the tiles that we observe. Um, we have to maximize that objective subject to a number of constraints. Uh, we, we have to be, um, it has to be nighttime. Uh, we have, we can't point too far away from the zenith um, so that we don't have um, too much, uh, too, too high air mass. Uh, we need to visit each field at least twice um, with half an hour between visits to rule out solar system objects. The telescope can't observe two different fields simultaneously. And we have to observe these fields within one night. The problem size is literally astronomical. So ZTF is restricted to pointing 
uh, at a grid of reference fields. There are about a thousand across the sky that have reference images. A reasonable exposure time for gravitational wave follow-up with ZTF is about 300 seconds per visit. And so we can observe about 100 fields in a given night. If you work out the number of possible combinations and permutations of fields that you could observe, it, tends, it turns out that it's about 10 to the power of 214. So that is clearly too many combinations to explore each possible combination. There's a lot of prior art for scheduling astronomical surveys and astronomical observations. There's Spike, which is a scheduler that was developed to um, schedule uh, HST. Um, it's modeled as a constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, there is some work that uh, Aaron Tohuvavahu did uh, with scheduling SWIFT, particularly for gravitational wave follow-up. I think this is supposed to be a movie. Yeah, there we go. Uh, showing the uh, slews of the telescope. Um, so this is using an approach that is called dynamic fuzzy constraint satisfaction. Um, there's Las Cumbres Observatory, of course, which I think is the most sophisticated example of a telescope network scheduler. So as we know, it's this global network of 23 telescopes at seven sites that has time competitively allocated to many different projects and also to education. And it is fully automated through a single uh, portal. And it uses an approach called integer linear programming, which is um, going to be something that I'm going to be dealing with a lot in this talk. These Wiki Transient Facilities Survey Scheduler, like Las Cumbres Observatory, uses integer linear programming and assigns requests to discrete time blocks. It operates six surveys simultaneously on the same uh, telescope and also has to deal with interrupts for targets of opportunity, like gravitational wave follow-ups. And it is trying to optimize the volumetric survey speed. And of course, there is also Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, Vera Rubin takes a very different approach. It's uh, modeling the problem as a Markov decision process, and it's optimized using reinforcement learning. So it's not uh, solving a global optimization problem. It's taking uh, one step at a time. And I think, yeah, finally, there is GWEM Opt, which is a Python package developed by Michael Coughlin which is capable of tiling and determining optimized exposure times for gravitational wave follow-up for a huge number of different uh, facilities. And it's been used um, in production for years by uh, Zwicky Transient Facility, by Growth, which is a consortium of facilities that are connected loosely with ZTF, and also Grandma. Um, so, we see a bunch of different solution strategies out there. Um, there's exhaustive search, which entails enumerating the entire, entire feasible set. It's trivial to implement. It's globally optimal. It has the significant downside that it can't be completed within a Hubble time or many Hubble times. Uh, we have greedy search, which takes a locally optimal move at each step. It has the advantage of being very easy to implement and very fast but the significant downside of generally being very suboptimal. Heuristics are specialized purpose-built strategies and rules of thumb. They have the advantage of having predictable behavior. They have the downside of requiring a lot of extra effort to design. Genetic algorithms involve mutating a set of incumbent solutions and letting them uh, evolve in a biologically inspired manner. This can be combined effectively with other strategies. It has the disadvantages of being unpredictable and sometimes slow. Lastly, we have mixed integer programming, which entails writing the pro pro problem as a linear program with both continuous and integer variables. And it has the advantage of being expressive and having uh, great automated solution methods. And it does have some disadvantages, but uh, I, I'll get into those in a little bit. So uh, GWEM Opt currently uses uh, the greedy search and it and heuristics, whereas the, the, the topic of the rest of this talk is mixed integer programming. So, uh, so what is mixed integer programming? Let's start with linear programming. So linear programming is the problem of 
maximizing a linear combination of decision variables subject to linear inequality constraints. So in this figure at the left, the uh, line here represents the objective function, and this filled polygon represents the system of nonlinear, er, sorry, the system of linear inequality constraints. Um, it's been studied for centuries, um, but uh, there were major advances in the 40s in terms of uh, developing algorithms for solving large-scale problems. Uh, the global optimum, if it exists, can be found in polynomial time, and it has important applications in many, many fields. Integer linear programming is a generalization of, or a superset of uh, linear programming, uh, where all variables must, must take integer or binary values, and mixed integer linear programming is, uh, is linear programming where some, but not all, variables uh, must take integer or binary values. So this is no longer a convex optimization problem. It's one of the classic examples of an NP-complete problem. Um, however, it's solvable by dynamic programming methods, such as branch and bound and branch and cut. And um, it's also very commercially important because it's used in many different industries. And powerful general purpose solvers have been avail available since the 1980s. The key advantage of this framework is it's going to allow us to focus more on describing our science requirements and less on how we get there. A classic integer linear programming problem is the maximum weighted coverage problem. You have a collection of elements here uh, depicted by these black circles with numbers in them, one through nine, and you have sets over those elements, S1, S2, S3, S4. Each of the elements has a weight. Your objective is to select up to K of the sets such that they're the sum of the weights of the elements that are contained in any of those sets is maximized. This has a natural application um, for uh, planning observations with a telescope um, because you can, um, you can map the, uh, the elements, uh, those, those black circles there, to points of interest on the sky, whether those are uh, potential host galaxies or whether they are um, you know, simply a dense grid of points over the sky, like a heel picks grid. The weights are the, um, you know, in the case of gravitational wave follow-up, are the gravitational wave probability map. And the subsets are the pixels or the points of interest that are contained within the field of view of the telescope um, in any given pointing. So uh, you can represent just about any logical constraint using integer linear programming. Don't worry about digesting this slide now. This is just, uh, I, I'll post these slides later. And this is really just there to give you a sense that whatever uh, you know, Boolean logical statement you want to make, there's a way to encode it as a, um, as a system of, of linear inequalities. So for example, S equals not A. So S is a binary variable which takes the value zero or one. And so is A, and so it's easy to see that S equals one minus A encodes that constraint. And you can, there are integer linear programming uh, implementations or, or transcriptions of all kinds of uh, logical statements like S equals A and B, if A then F of X is less than or equal to zero, so on and so forth. So um, uh, what I did is I wrote a toy integer linear programming or uh, solver to schedule uh, observations with, uh, with ZTF. So um, we have binary decision variables that map to the uh, maximum set cover problem here. And we have continuous decision variables to, den to denote the start times of the observations. The objective is to maximize the weighted sum over the uh, heel picks pixels on the sky. We have uh, integer linear constraints encoding the set cover part of the problem. And we have continuous linear constraints implementing uh, the uh, requirement that the telescope isn't pointing at more than one field simultaneously. 
Um, so a couple things that I learned uh, while I was implementing this um, about just integer linear programming in general. Um, first, you want to avoid unnecessary redundancy in your decision variables. So uh, this, this is you know, particularly important for um, you know, binary decision variables. So you want to express the problem with um, in such a way that the, there are as few degrees of freedom as possible. Um, on the other hand, sometimes it is helpful to introduce auxiliary degrees of freedom, auxiliary decision variables, in order to avoid, in order to avoid unnecessarily dense um, uh, vectors of coefficients. So, um, for example, if you have a, um, you know, if if you have a linear combination or a Boolean combination of many decision variables that occurs in many different constraints, it may be worthwhile to introduce and additional variables so that um, those constraints can be implemented uh, sparsely. Um, you want to think about relaxations of your problem. So sometimes you can make your problem easier to solve by removing or weaken, weakening some of the constraints. Sometimes these are approximations to your problem, and sometimes they, they yield problems that have exactly the same solutions but are more tractable. So an example is that if you have uh, a decision variable that is a unit vector, normally you would require that that variable has a norm of one, but in many cases you can relax that to the constraint that the norm is greater than or equal to one um, without changing the, um, the solutions of the problem. Um, next, problem synthesis can be a bottleneck. Uh, so, you know, so, so these ultimately you have to go from, you know, your conceptual representation of your problem to a, a system of equations, which uh, is realized as, uh, you know, variables and matrices. And you have to think carefully about what is the um, most efficient way to implement that transcription. Um, and then, you know, maybe the, and uh, another very important cons uh, consideration is what solver do you use? So there are three very powerful uh, mixed integer programming solvers on the market. There is Express, which uh, interestingly enough is made by FICO, um, actually it was purchased by FICO, but um, and, that, and yes, that's the same FICO that is that you think about uh, when you get your credit score. Um, Cplex, which is a product of IBM, again, it was purchased by IBM, and then Garobi, which is a bit of a an upstart um, and was founded only in 2008, and they market themselves as the world's fastest solver. Um, and I think there is perhaps some truth to that. Um, and so these products are normally kind of pricey. I mean, they're, they're, they cost uh, about as much as high-end computer-aided design or printed circuit board layout software, but they all have free licenses for um, use in the classroom or for non-commercial research for people at, uh, who have .edu email addresses. Um, there are also open source mixed integer programming solvers out there. Um, I've listed a handful of them. Um, but none of these are at all competitive in terms of solution speed or quality with those big three solvers, but they are okay sometimes for smaller problems. Uh, okay, so now I get to show some, some videos, some demos. So here is a, the global optimum for, uh, uh, for ZTF for following up uh, LIGO Virgo S20.0105AE, which I think was a neutron star black hole merger. And I was able to solve it on my laptop all the way to global optimality in about 100 seconds. Um, so I'll roll the video. So it's um, tiling this error region and it's, trying, and it's uh, requiring that it visits each field twice and that there's a half hour separation between each of the visits. So what you'll notice as this other uh, lobe of the localization swings into view is that the telescope is, is hopping back and forth between uh, opposite horizons. Now, it's allowed to do that partly because I haven't implemented slew speed constraints yet. But even so, um, this is a, uh, a feature of the global optimum um, for the way that I've implemented the problem that a greedy algorithm would never be able to find because a greedy algorithm would um, try to stay um, sort of in one place. You might see it you know, walking up and down the zenith um, and it would never be able to access this kind of solution.
So uh, there are lots of advantages of, of a mixed integer programming target of opportunity toolkit. We can make more efficient use of our observing time. At least in this example, we can find the global optimum so that we can't do any better than this. Um, we can spend less effort on how to create our observing strategy so that we can focus more of our time describing our science requirements, which is a better use of our time. This is going to be easier to extend to jointly planning observations with a network of telescopes, which I think that Les Cumbres Observatory has shown. Um, it's potentially easier, easier to generalize to other science cases, other telescopes, other instruments. And since these commercial MIP solvers are parallel, um, they can be sped up if necessary by deploying them on large mini core workstations. Um, so I'm going to keep right on going, and I'm I, I I'm going to I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, space telescopes and what what how, how the problem is a little different for them. Um, so. I'm, I'm uh, supporting a mission called Dorado um, as uh, the mission's project scientist. Dorado is a, a, an ultraviolet telescope um, that we hope to will uh, fly if it's approved in uh, 2025, uh, right around uh, LIGO 05. Um, Dorado is uh, a very large field of view near UV telescope. Coincidentally, actually, it's not, a, it's not a coincidence at all. By design, it has as large a field of view as ZTF. Um, it has, a, it, it's going to go down to almost 21st magnitude in about five minutes of exposure time. Um, uh, and uh, it's, um, so it's, its field of view is just much bigger than any other near UV um, uh, telescope that's flown in space before. Um, so it's going to do a whole bunch of really cool survey science, um, uh, you know, studying everything from, you know, supernova shock cooling to massive stars. But its primary mission, and this is very important, its, it, its main purpose is to, is to do ultraviolet follow-up of gravitational wave events. So because it has this huge field of view, um, we're going to be able to tile the entire gravitational wave error region each orbit. So whereas with SWIFT, it would take us many, many orbits to tile enough of the error region to actually find the location of the counterpart, with Dorado, we're going to be able to hit it again and again and again and again every 90 minutes uh, each time the satellite completes an orbit. And this is going to allow us to build up this uh, you know, very densely sampled light curve. It's going to provide us with uh, crucial near UV coverage, which is really important for diagnosing the emission mechanism at very early times. And uh, the main science that it's going to do is it's going to allow us to distinguish between um, purely, you know, radioactively powered kilonova emission and shock interaction powered emission, where you have some interaction between the ultra relativistic jets trying to punch its way out of the ejecta versus and, and the ejecta itself. Um, so uh, I developed using these same mixed integer programming techniques, a uh, target of opportunity scheduler for Dorado um, that I use to perform uh, simulations of the Dorado uh, concept of operations for the concept study report that we recently submitted to NASA headquarters. Um, so this is, so, so this animation shows a follow-up of a simulated uh, LIGO Virgo event from 05. Um, and uh, it's you can see a couple regions that it's avoiding. It's avoiding the galactic plane, it's avoiding the uh, the um, sun, it's or sorry, it's avoiding the moon, it's avoiding the sun, and it's um, also avoiding the uh, you know the earth and it's not doing any observations when, while it's passing through the South Atlantic anomaly. So all of these constraints are implemented using integer linear programming. And it is, again, it is you know, finding the global optimum every single time in the space of about a minute for every single one of about 5,000 simulated events. Um, so now, as, as I so, so as so this is fully discretized in all of the decision variables, in, in the time of the observation, in the position on the sky, and in the roll angle. So that, uh, because, because of that discretization, there is, and due to the curse of dimensionality, 
it, that the, the, the way that we've chopped up the parameter space has to be very close. So we, we, we search over, so, so, so the uh, observation times are uh, gridded up in one minute increment, increments, and we use a very coarse heel picks grid with a 1.8 degree resolution for right ascension and declination and uh, 10 degree increments in roll. So this leads to some artifacts. So you can see in this example image here, um, you know, there are, um, you know, the, the fields don't line up exactly how you would do it, you know, if you were a human by hand trying to, you know, uh, solve this like a puzzle. And um, so, you know, I think that the scientific impact of, you know, this, these discretization impact artifacts are pretty minimal, um, but nonetheless, we're spending tens of millions of dollars to launch a satellite, so we'd like to be perfect. And um, so I've thought a little bit about how to avoid uh, discretizing the problem. So um, uh, one way to do that is to cast the problem as, uh, so instead of integer linear programming, we use integer quadratic programming, where the, um, the cost function and or some of the objectives are quadratic rather than linear. So in this case, the quadratic constraint is, um, you know, so if we assume we have a circular field of view, so we're really just testing, you know, for each of our heel picks pixels, is it, you know, when we take the dot product with the pointing vector of the spacecraft, is it less than or equal to the cosine of the opening angle of the field of view? And the, the quadratic constraint is just that the um, uh, pointing vector has to have a norm less than or equal to one. And that's an example of a, of a relaxation. Um, so now what if we want to, what, what if we don't have a circular field of view? I mean, no telescope has a circular field of view. They're usually um, rectangles because they're CCDs. Um, so, uh, so we need to represent, we need to be able to describe the full spatial rotation, the sp full attitude of the spacecraft. You would do that with quat quaternions um, and um, you can write any, you, using quaternions, you can write any rotation, you, you can write the elements of any three by three rotation matrix as, uh, as a set of quadratic expressions. Um, and uh, then it's quite straightforward to um, encode the, you know, the sort of hit test to determine if a given, given point of interest is within the telescope's field of view um, using um, quadratic inequalities. Um, so, so that's, that's a way to directly encode the problem exactly. Um, now, uh, we may, so, so quadratic programming is a lot harder than linear programming. Um, so we, it may be beneficial to, um, keep the problem, uh, linear. So, um, one way to do that is to make use of the small angle approximation. So, which is, you know, as you know, all of us with, you know, physics or astronomy backgrounds know is extremely forgiving. So the idea here is that you pick some discretization over SO3, this, the, the, um, the group of spatial rotations. Um, uh, that, for example, that could be a very coarse heel picks grid for you know right ascension and declination for right ascension and declination, and a very coarse um, regular grid for roll. Um, and then you have you introduce binary decision variables to select amongst all of those coarse pointings, and then you linearize the um, a perturbation around any one of those um, coarse pointings. And so as you can see, you know, if you, if you, if you start, you, you know, so, th so this, this, this box is the size and shape of the Dorado or the ZTF field of view. And as you move it around, as you um, perturb its, uh, you know, orientation, you can, you can um, walk really far away from the origin and still have very small distortions. Um, so, uh, so the idea is here is you have integer variables for coarse pointing and linear variable and continuous bounded linear variables for the fine pointing. Um, and this, is, this would be a pure MIP implementation. So um, some conclusions. So MIP is an expressive and very powerful mathematical language for describing and solving observation planning problems. It holds the promise of allowing us to move beyond merely describing the strategy and allows us to focus on describing the science requirements, which is a better use of our time. 
I would argue that this is actually the natural way to express and solve multi-messenger uh, observing problems. Although there are much fancier algorithms, such as the uh, machine learning techniques that are used by, for example, Vera Rubin, at least in this case, they don't seem to be necessary because the MIP, uh, the, the MIP approach appears to be perfectly adequate to the problem scale. And it's also easier to express hard constraints that may not ever be violated, that you know, sharp boundaries that you cannot cross in the MIP language. Um, and I think that this technology is very well known in other disciplines. And so I think that there's a lot of potential to um, make use of expertise in other domains. So I have, I have a bunch of next steps. So I, I wanna try the uh, quadratic programming formulation of these problems, of, of the problem for space telescopes. Um, I want to, I, I know I need to add um, constraints for overhead, including slew speed and filter change. Um, I know that, you know, ultimately the goal is not to cover the region of interest on the sky. The goal is to detect the counterpart. So we want to incorporate the light curve model into the objective function. Um, we want to vary exposure times to adjust for spatially varying sensitivity. So that includes, you know, air, air mass, air glow, zodiacal light, extinction, so on and so forth. We want to close the loop. We want to make turn this into a you know a feedback control system where you know we alter our plan for the rest of the night based on what observations succeed and fail. Um, we want to make the we, we want to make the system robust with respect to unpredictable things like changes in weather and changes in uh, you know uh, um, you know other science targets that other users are placing on the system and so. Um, that means that we might not, in, instead of optimizing, you know, the best case payoff that every single one of the observations that we re request gets executed, maybe we want, to we want to optimize the average payoff with respect to some distribution of adverse impacts. Um, and lastly, uh, I want to move toward a unified observation planning toolkit for both ground and space-based facilities. So, you know, what would a great energy programming uh, observation planning toolkit look like. So I think it would it would have uh, it would include a domain specific language that is purpose built for expressing constraints and observing pro programs. Um, and here I'm going to draw my inspiration from Astroplan. Um, there would be a clean separation between problem problem description and solution method. It would be deeply integrated with the AstroPy ecosystem. It would probably be an AstroPy affiliated package. Um, it would be parallelized. It would make use of the uh, parallel, uh, you know, features of all of those big three commercial solvers. It would have a well-documented REST API and, and a web front end. Um, so I, 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 I thought a little bit about what the architecture looks like. I, th I think that um, it would have a public API that consists of, you know, an object-oriented problem description. Um, with a, you know, in a way that is, you know, designed to operate well with AstroPy coordinates and times and so on and so forth. Um, it would be able to use external data files for ephemerides, for field of view geometry, so on and so forth. Um, that would get translated to an intermediate representation, representation, which might use a deep learning framework like TensorFlow. Um, and the reason is that um, we need to be able to perform transformations of the, um, of the objective function and constraints in order to plug them into different kinds of solvers. So for the um, integer linear programming solvers, you know, this approach would let us, um, you know, uh, I, I hope would be a way to um, achieve some vendor neutrality and avoid vendor lock-in and would also give us um, you know faster problem synthesis as compared to existing Python interfaces for these solvers, including their own proprietary Python interfaces. Um, and then for you know gradient descent techniques, um, we would be able to use the auto automatic differentiation cap capabilities that are built into these frameworks. Um, so yeah. So you know a lot of these ideas that I've talked about are already there in this um, Astro 2020 uh, white paper. Um, and, you know, many of the authors are in this call or come to this call regularly. Um, so, you know, I really just like to take what's in this paper and build it. Um, and, 
I even have a name for it. It's going to be called the Multi-Mission multi Multi-Messenger Observation Planning Toolkit, which is pronounced mm -mm opt. And that's the end of my slides. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Leo. That was very interesting. Um, any questions for Leo? Uh, Adam? So, yeah, sorry if I, uh, if I break up in the middle here. Um, so I, I was wondering how much of, you know, we, we talking about making things more general purpose. I was thinking, you know, going further, one can imagine it being a service, but how, how, how much of the difference between doing this for one um, observing facility and another uh, comes down to things that you could put in configuration file and how much of it is sort of hand tuning? Yeah, um, I think that I, I don't have nearly enough experience with energy linear programming to have a, a, a good answer for that. Um, I think that um, I think that it I, I mean I think that it, it does require some I mean there are sort of hyper parameters that you can set in, in order to control the behavior of the solvers. So for example, you know in, in, in all of the um, you know demos that I showed, I was able to solve all the way to optimality in an acceptable amount of time. Um, but you know maybe you have, you know, hard time constraints and maybe you're pushing the limits of the solver. And so there are knobs that you can tune to tell the solver to, um, you know, more aggressively apply, uh, so, you know, heuristics earlier on to find good quality feasible solutions, um, even though they don't necessarily help you get to the global optimum in any particular amount of time. So those, those sorts of knobs you can turn. Um, and it's, it's also, you know, it, it's it's very important to test your, um, you know, your problem formulation against the solver that you're using. So there is, yeah, there, there's. I think there's a lot to be learned with, re, with respect to what is the best, you know, formulation of any given problem. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I missed the order of the hands, but let's try Andy. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Leo, for a nice uh, presentation and uh, laying out the problem really well. So this this thing at the end you're talking about is uh, basically a project we are doing this. So we have the um, we have a thing called the, what is it called? Open Telescope Control System or something like that. Um, and it was funded by one of these, I think Simons or somebody, I can't remember. So we're, we're taking our uh, observatory control system, making it open source and making so anybody could use it. And part of that is the scheduler and um, so one of the issues is, as you mentioned, some of these um, solving kernels are like proprietary. We use the Groby kernel, last I checked. And, um, but uh, as Curtis tells me, there's like a common API so you can actually swap out the, the um, solvers. And, um, but that's been an issue we've thought about. I don't know if Curtis or Rachel want to say more, they may know more about it. At any rate, we are, I think you know joining forces would be a good idea because we are well on the way to doing this exact thing that you mentioned is a good idea. Sure. I'll follow up. I'll follow up with you offline about that. Sounds good. Great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Mario. Yeah. Thanks, Leo. Um, I was just curious for 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 Ruben. Uh, do you know if anyone's actually tried uh, scheduling with injured programming, or is there any fundamental why they 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 couldn't do it that way? You know, that's a good question. I think um, Eric Bellum has thought a lot about that. I think he's of the opinion that um, you could use integer linear programming. I think that because of I so so I think that. Vera Rubin would have to do what ZTF does, which is rather than you know micromanage the um, you know the times of the this, the start and end times of the observations, like I did for my ZTF you know toy scheduler. I think he would. I, I think you would have a um, higher level approach where you would um, you know decide on each night what science program you. What, what science programs you observe and then you would 
you know, sequence them into blocks, um, which actually, you know, again, is, you know, more similar, I think, to the approach that LCO uses. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, Rich, did you have a question? Your hand went up and then down. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I wasn't sure I was going to get you, and I have to I have to jump off a little bit. Early. That was a great talk, by the way. So, so I actually have um, uh, a couple of questions. You know, the first is how important is optimality? Often, when you look at these things, you're getting an optimal solution, but but a heuristic can get to you know sometimes two percent or one percent away from optimal, and you know with with a lot less computational effort. And then the second thing is that. It, you know, when I looked at the Vera Rubin thing that you presented, it, it seemed to me that that would be a strategy where, where if you had a problem with moving the telescope back and forth very quickly, let's say, or, or you didn't want to, you know, stress the equipment, let's just take the telescope out of it, that, that you know, you're going to you're going to get a much more localized solution out of uh, an RL approach than you will out of, uh, MI, out of MIP. Unless you, as you say, you do the constraint thing that takes into account, you know, the physics of moving your telescope around, but but that substantially complicates the um, the constraint space. So so have you have you thought about you know uh, about how much that complicates the 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 problem space? I have. Um, I mean, I'm I'm just in the process now of trying to figure out, you know, how to add. Slew constraints, which is which is a big part of it, um, and I, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I'm learning. <laughs> I'll I'll have to get back to you. And no, 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 it's a great answer, really. I mean, and, and that is in no way meant to be a criticism. Let me just let me just follow up and say, I, I think it's great. I think what you've done is exactly what you want to do, which is look at what the technology will give you. And the quality of the solutions and whether you get optimality. Yeah. Sort of, you know, having been down this path in other domains, then the next question is, do you need optimality? And, you know, are you taking into account all of the constraints you need to, need to take into account? Because, because sometimes these things explode, sometimes they don't. When you add constraints, you can, you can blow them up to be far more complicated, uh, sometimes not. But, but for sure, this is, is, you know, the right thing to do uh, yeah. as a first cut. I would have done this before a neural network or an RL approach 50 times out of 50, but then yeah. think about whether there's something they're getting out of it, that, that this will be, it'll be hard to replicate here. Yeah. So another nice thing about these MIP solvers is that they all, as, as I said, they support, um, you, you can configure them to either, you know, try to get to the global optimum as fast as possible or give you high quality feasible solutions as early on as possible, or some or, or compromises in between, and you know you can dial that all the way back and forth. And to that, I would add that you never get a truly optimal solution because you're always making some kind of compromises to to get the solution to solve at least in the LCO case, uh, in in some reasonable amount of time. And so it's just a question of which assumptions do you leave out. I mean, uh, and and which do you put in and uh, so there is, there's, you know, it's, it's optimal to, you know, to the best of the information you gave it, but we're almost never giving, unless it's, if it's a straightforward problem, maybe you can give it all the information, but in, in our case, we can't. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, there's some interesting discussion in the chat, but uh, I think Aaron, you have a question? Yeah, Leo, thanks. This is an awesome talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to, I guess this was more of a, a response to some of the other things that were said um, in response to your talk, but I think that I, maybe I'll try to phrase more generally. If you were really serious about wanting to have this be applicable to space telescopes too, and I want you to be serious because I want to do it with you, um, then I think, you know, things like um, what Andy was talking about, like the LCO schedule, I think the thing is that they are just radically different types of constraints and radic and the problem formulation is just so different that I think you might end up not 
really being able to marry them in the in one scheduler sort of formulation in a in a nice way. I mean, you could package it and call it with the same name, but I guess I I'm having a hard time, you know, uh, communicating this. I think what I'm trying to say is right. Like there is really no such thing as a space telescope TOO scheduler, right? The yeah. concept of a TOO is that you know you have you interrupt some other schedule that's going on and you can kind of ignore what the other schedule was going on. But for a space telescope, because you're actually dynamically managing the health and safety constraints, you're not just planning the TO, you're actually just rescheduling the entire space telescope, right? So it's not really an interrupt. And then as you well know, and we've communicated, you also in, in, those, in those constraints have to be like things like your entire thermal model of the spacecraft um, mm -hmm. and your entire ACS model. And these things tend to just like radically complicate the solution space. And this is, I'm not saying anything you don't know. I'm just saying that I'm not a hundred percent sure that that can be done in a way that's like good and usable to the community that meets the requirements on the space side and the ground side. And it, I, my assumption is it'll have to be split off, but I'm, I'm down to try. Well, I, I agree with everything you said. I'm going to push back a little bit because I think that this toolkit is exactly what we need for multi-messenger because there are there simply are wavelengths that we can't observe from the ground and there are wavelengths that we can't observe from space and so we just you know this is a problem that we have and we if we don't uh, part of how i went down this rabbit hole was as i was getting started on dorado i was trying to use astroplan to um do some of the concept of operation studies and thinking, gosh, this is a great tool. If only the, um, if only it didn't assume that your observer is pinned to the surface of the earth. And I, I'm up, I, I think that we can find an abstraction. I think we can, I think that certainly, you know, a modeling language, a domain specific language, it's like AstroPlan, but applicable to satellites in earth orbit and to ground-based telescopes, I think that's doable. And I know that the you know, operations research side is a solvable problem because I've solved it multiple times. And we, we all have solved it multiple times. And uh, uh, to uh, Aaron's point, I think, I think you're both saying probably the same thing that um, like for our, for LCO, we have a 0.4 meter network, a one meter network and a two meter network. And, and they're all scheduled separately, but using the same tools because the observations are not uh, fungible, you know, like if you, if, because they have different cameras and whatever, different capabilities. And so um, that's one way to do it. We've thought about ways of making it so that, okay, if I got my two meter observation, now I don't need my one meter observation. You can awful, often handle those cases outside of the scheduler uh, mm -hmm. and then just take them out of the scheduler. Um, but anyway, there's multiple ways of doing it, but I think just having the toolkit works. And yes, I think each space mission is so unique, it will be slightly different. But uh, I mean, I have also sat down with people who do sp like space missions. And like for HST, I was like, let's come on, like, like, how are you guys doing it? And you know, for two hours, talk to the people doing it. And it's like, they're basically using the equivalent of like, I don't know, an abacus and a magic wand or something is so primitive and ridiculous compared to what the way they could be doing it. And uh, having these kinds of tools available. Uh, and making them easy to use may go some of the way. A lot of the other problem is honestly sociological at all of these facilities, because I've tried with so many facilities and, and I'm like, what you have a person just put down, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the top priority ones first and then the next and then the next, like, that is ridiculous, but that's, it. you know, it doesn't matter. That's the way they've always done it. They're loath to change, you know, until you give them everything wrapped up in a bow and you say, just let me do it for you. Just give me, you know, the inputs and I'll just do it. And, and then maybe they'll try, but it's, it's right. very I mean, hard. One of, one of the issues, Andy, is that we can't give you the inputs. Like that's, I mean, that's part of the thing that I was trying to communicate is that making it flexible enough to have like constraint classes that people can like insert their thermal model here and insert their ACS model here because they're not gonna, they can't, we can't give you those things. Um, it's that's part of the problem. That, that's usually not because they're unknown, though. That's because the details are export controlled. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm talking both. about, the sociological limit, limitation. I think the other uh, secondary piece that, based on something you were saying, Aaron, is you said, you know, 
you talk about a spacecraft taking into account the entire state of the spacecraft. Yet yeah, th that is certainly going to be a very complicated optimization problem. But you know, fundamentally, it's what LCO scheduler already does. We fully reschedule the network every what two minutes or five minutes um, because we're constantly taking into account the state of the weather. You know, we have fewer constraints probably on the ground, but the language to describe them is not as different as you might think. And it's not even. I, I think the main difference is just the time scales. I mean, I, I think like, you know, for example, the constraint that the spacecraft's radiator on the plus X face has to point 50 degrees away from the earth. You know, that's not, that that's not so different from the constraint that, you know, you can't flip the telescope upside down. Or that's right, but it's, 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 <laughs> I think that's, that's right, Leo, but I think in, in what I'm saying is that in practice, it, it's much more complicated than that because that's not the constraint, right? If you could think about it like a science constraint, right? Like the higher, you might say, look, I wanna point at this part of the sky because this is where my highest probability region is. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're like, technically I can from constraints, but it puts the uh, radiator earth elevation angle at a bad place. And then, then my CCD temperature goes up and then my uh, you know, sensitivity goes down. And so you basically need a full instrument model to, to, to calculate that trade there, right? Is that field still worth visiting even though it's the highest probability one, even though it will you know, probably not only degrade the, the quality of the data that I get for that, but there's high thermal inertia for these systems. So it then will degrade the quality of all downstream observations for a few hours and things like that. And it, the same thing propagates into, you know, the attitude control system. And anyway, I, I'm not trying to be a downer at all. And I feel like I am, so I'm gonna stop. But Aaron, like yeah. if, if a human can think through, needs to think through these things, a computer can do it too. And much, much, much faster. Yeah, I'm not saying that a computer can't do it. I, I solved it on a computer. That's, that's, not, that's not my claim. Okay, well, I want to make sure everybody uh, has a chance to make a comment. So Rachel, did you still want to comment? Thanks, yes. Um, this, thank you, Leo, for a really interesting talk. And I, I wanted to broaden the conversation out a little bit in the sense of rather than considering um, single facility uh, scheduling, multi-messenger um, astrophysics is denoted by the fact that we use so many different facilities all trying to follow up the same gravitational wave alert or whatever. And an interesting problem to consider would be how you optimize many different facilities um, to perform that follow-up. Yes. Have yep. you considered that? Uh, only, in, only to the extent that you just you know, named the problem, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm keenly aware that you know, that is also a non-convex <laughs> optimization problem that you can solve with the same mathematics. And I, right. I, I'd like to look at it, but I, I, have, I have not put, I've not put the same, I've not put the thought into it that I have for these problems where I've, you know, gone and, you know, prototyped a, a, an implementation. Right. It, it's something that we're particularly interested from the point of view of the Aeon network that we're trying to develop and trying to incorporate other facilities. And there are a range of interesting, um, technical and, as Andy said, sociological issues that come up in the process. And I think what you've described is something that can go a long way to solving it. Uh, but at the moment, it's something that is on our to-do list rather than being done. So I'm very interested to see your work in this area. Thank you. Yeah. OK, great. And then, uh, Curtis, did you say what you wanted already? Yeah, I was just going to reiterate, you know, a lot of these problems are larger sociological problems than they are technical. Definitely. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. Um, but let's uh, thank Leo again for a really informative talk. I think uh, it sounds like there'll be some interesting collaborations to come out of this. Uh, so thanks again, Leo. Thank you. And um, yeah, and uh, let's see. Kurt has posted a couple of links. Uh, I don't know if you want to sort of follow those up in an email to the mailing list, Curtis. Uh, just yeah, I'm, so that I'm happy to do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. so we can sort of uh, keep that conversation going. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, and keep an eye out for the next uh, public talk announcement.